I'd like to call to order the special meeting of the Tiverton Town Council and public hearing to discuss the future of Tiverton Solid Waste Management Plan. We'll start by standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Jeannie, do you want to take the roll? Present. Present. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out and braving the cold and a little bit of icy roads to come tonight. We're going to talk about um, what happens when our landfill closes, which will be in November of 2020. Um, just a little bit of background. The council um, had a workshop uh, with uh, PAR Engineering, and Tim Theis from PAR is here tonight in July to begin the process of discussing what we do when the landfill closes. And at that point, we had some decisions that we had to make. Um, because the options were pretty broad, everything from discontinuing municipal trash pickup all the way up to building a complete transfer station and continuing with curbside service but with our own transfer station. Um, at that time, the, the one thing that we took off the table uh, was the transfer station, simply because the estimated cost was in about the $2 million range to build the transfer station. Um, in addition, the timing was going to be rather tight. Um, so, you know, we've got some options on the table, which include just going, you know, curb service like we have today with direct haul to Johnston, um, as well as another option, which would include, again, curb service, but building a recycling center. So in a minute, Tim uh, Theis from PAR Engineering is going to take over and he's going to do a brief presentation for you and sort of outline the various options and some of the components and what the costs would be and what the service levels would be. And then after that, we'd very much like to hear from you, hear your questions, hear your opinions. Um, again, thank you to those of you who came out tonight. I also know that there are probably a number of us watching uh, live on uh, the internet as many people like to do. So I'm going to turn it over to Tim and then we'll have plenty of time for discussion. Thank you. Everybody here? No. Oh, hello. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tim Peace. I'm an engineer with Car Corporation. Uh, I've been working with the town now for about 18 years um, at the landfill and working with the town on solid waste management. Um, engineering and planning. Um, my firm, Car Corporation, uh, has been working with the town now for almost uh, almost 40 years um, at the landfill. So we've been involved with, with Tiverton and, and solid waste management planning now for about 40 years. Um, so why are we here tonight? Oh, does everybody have a handout with the green lettering on it? If not, it's available up here at the at the front. So, like I mentioned, why are we here tonight? Well, as of November 30th, 2020, so just about a year from now, the landfill will be officially closed. And that's as mandated by the state. The State Department of Environmental Management regulates landfills. Um, they have been involved in this land, with this landfill since it, it was first permitted back in the, in the late 70s. And, you know, through various permit extensions that we've gotten over the years and planning with them, um, the date was set a few years ago that the last day we would be allowed to accept trash was November 30th, uh, 2020. So that is the day that the landfill will be closed uh, in Tiverton. So the question is, what do we do in town with trash once the landfill is closed? So the town has been planning on this, uh, you know, has really been working since about 2011 on a plan for, uh, you know, the life after the landfill. Um, it, back in 2011, a, a, a really comprehensive study was commissioned on what to do, uh, where it looked at a number of options, like Trish mentioned, you know, a, a, a transfer station, direct haul to central landfill, um, 
you know, various versions of, of consolidating with other communities. And, you know, what came out of it um, is that what it looks like the, the future of trash in, in town is going to be some combination of curbside pickup and possibly a recycling center um, in the community. This is going to be a big change, though, in town. Um, you know, people are very used to having the landfill in town. Um, it's a convenience for everybody. And so this is going to be a big change. So one of the things that we discussed at our July meeting is, is the need for a sort of a robust public outreach program um, to bring everybody up to speed, everybody in town up to speed on what's going on with the landfill and what the future of solid waste is. And this, this meeting is really one of, is really part of that public outreach program. So after the landfill closes, how, how is trash going to be different? How is this program going to be different? Well, what the town has right now, I'll just give you a brief overview of, of what the program looks like right now. So right now, the town provides curbside pickup. It's run through a private contractor called MEGA Disposal. So MEGA runs two trucks in town five days a week. One of those trucks is for recycling. That recycling is delivered to the central landfill in Johnston, Rhode Island. The second truck picks up trash and that trash is delivered to the Tiverton landfill, to the town's landfill in the southern part of town. Right now, about 6,900 residents are served by MEGA disposal and by the town's curbside pickup program. The town also receives and collects at the landfill and other places in town other types of waste and other types of recycling. Um, tires, white goods, unadulterated wood waste, which is like unpainted, unstained wood, um, bulky waste, which would be like couches, chairs, stuff like that, a desk that you need to get rid of, that's considered bulky waste. Uh, mattresses, used mattresses, yard waste, and e-waste are collected uh, primarily at the top of the landfill. Um, and then they're recycled from there. They go to various different outlets for recycling. Tires go to one recycling facility. Uh, used mattresses go to another. White goods have the refrigerant removed, and they're taken to a, a, a facility. So that's all done right now at the top of the landfill. This program, the curbside pickup program, and the operation of the landfill uh, run the town about just over a million dollars per year. That's the, the cost of running the landfill and the cost of the curbside pickup program. So in the near future, when the landfill is closed, we're going to have a different program. And right now, like I said, it looks like probably we'll continue with a curbside pickup program and possibly add a recycling center. So the curbside pickup program will be very much what you know now. Trash and, and mixed recycling will get picked up at the curb. The difference is the trash will no longer go to Tiverton Landfill. The trucks will turn around and they will take it to Central Landfill in Johnston, Rhode Island. We could expand that curbside pickup program to accommodate some of the material that we're now collecting at the top of the landfill. And that would mean picking up at the curb things like white goods. Those are things like refrigerators, stoves, air conditioners. Bulky waste, again, things like couches and, and desks and things like that. Um, and yard waste. Yard waste is picked up right now um, by the town. Um, the, the curbside pickup program in the future could include, continue to include yard waste. Things that will probably not be picked up at the curb would be things like e-waste, which is like electronics, tires, and used mattresses. And the reason those wouldn't get picked up at the curb is the vol well, the e-waste is part of a state-run program um, that the town participates in. And so to that, to, for that program to function, they get collected at a very specific location um, and they're handled very specifically. So curbside pickup for e-waste is not, not really an option. Um, and then tires and used mattresses, the, the volume's just not there to make curbside pickup uh, really viable. So those things would likely not get picked up at the curb, which means that the town would have to provide a place for those materials. Excuse me. So that's where a recycling center will come in. A recycling center could handle all or some combination of things like white goods, tires, mattresses, the e-waste. Um, it could also handle things like hard plastics, metals, um, provide a place for people to drop off yard waste. Um, it could also provide uh, what we would call convenience drop-off for the mixed recyclables. So these are the recyclables that you would put out on the curb uh, for your regular pickup. But if, say, you had a, a, a particularly large volume in any given week, or maybe you missed your regular pickup day, 
you could take those mixed recycles, recyclables to the recycling center and drop them off there. What we would not be able to accommodate at a recycling center would be the bulky waste. Bulky waste is considered municipal solid waste, so if you start collecting that in any real volume, the state will start to regulate you like a transfer station. And there's a whole set of requirements, a whole set of regulations around transfer stations. They're very expensive to operate, they're very expensive to build. Um, if we started collecting bulky waste there, we would be considered a transfer station. So that's the one thing that we wouldn't be able to collect at a recycling center, would be those oddball sort of chairs and desks and stuff like that. That would probably remain a curbside pickup uh, item. So the cost of, of this program, this curbside pickup this ex and an expanded curbside pickup program and some, some recycling center that handles some of this material um, is likely to cost around one and a half million dollars per year. So the, the town has been working since, uh, for a few months now, particularly since the July meeting, we've been working with the current um, curbside pickup contractor to look at expanded curbside pickup programs and what those might cost and, um, and how those might work. One of the reasons that the, and the, the primary reason that the cost of the program, your solid waste program is gonna go from a million plus to about 1.5 million is really the trash. It's taking the trash to central landfill, right? So right now, like I said, the, the trash, the contractor picks up the trash, he takes it to, central, to Tiverton landfill. In the future, he's gonna have to turn those trucks around and drive them over to central landfill. That added trucking cost, because he's gonna have to put more trucks on the road um, because of the greater travel time it takes to get from here to central landfill. He's gonna have to add trucks in town. Um, that added trucking cost is probably gonna run about $120,000 a year. Once those trucks arrive in, in Johnston at central landfill, there's gonna be a tipping fee associated based on the tonnage that's tipped, right? The central landfill has a municipal rate, which the town will take advantage of. It's a special rate for communities. But even with that rate, the tipping fee is estimated to be about $310,000 per year. And that's based on about 6,000 tons of trash per year, which is about what the town is doing right now. So those two costs really account for the bulk of the cost increase for the program. Those two costs are about $430,000 a year. Um, and that's really the bulk of that, of that added cost. We will also have additional costs associated with um, any items that get picked up at the curb, like white goods, bulky waste, that kind of stuff. That will add cost to the program as well, um, but not as significant as the cost of actually just trucking the trash to the landfill and the tipping fee that we're going to pay. So at the same time that the town has been working with the, the private contractor to work on an expanded program, we've also been looking at sites for a recycling center. We started with um, dozens of potential sites in town to site our recycling center. Um, and we screened those sites based on a number of criteria, um, a few of which I've listed here. Size being probably the first and foremost criteria. To make a recycling center work, particularly one that can accommodate all of the yard waste that the town generates on an annual basis. So right now, for those of you who might not know, the yard waste is collected at the top of the landfill. It is ground up, it's mixed with soil, and it's used as cover material at the landfill. Once the landfill is closed, we won't be able to do that anymore. So we have to find a place to uh, store the, the yard waste, at least on a temporary basis. And that is a very sizable operation. The yard waste takes up a lot of space. So to, like I said, we screen the sites based on size first. So we really need like a two to four acre site to make a recycling center with a yard waste area um, viable. So most of the sites fell out when we screened them based on size. And we got down to about a dozen sites. We then looked at other constraints on those sites, things like wetlands. How many sites had wetlands? And were those wetlands going to, to really constrain us on those sites? And a number of the sites that we looked at had a lot of wetlands. They were very wet. And so those sites fell out of our evaluation. We also looked at accessibility. We want a site that is convenient to most major transportation routes. Like, we don't want this site buried necessarily at the end of some small cul-de-sac that's difficult to get to. Uh, so we want it to be accessible. We also want to put a site generally in the area where the recycling is being generated. Right now the landfill is at the southern end of town, right? Something like two-thirds of the town's population lives north of Bulga Marsh Road. So we want something that's closer to where the, the people are that are going to be generating the recycling in order to keep those, um, those trips to the recycling shorter 
um, and you know that reduces traffic on the roads, that reduces air pollution. You know, we want to keep that shorter. So we want to put it closer to where people are generating the recycling. Um, and then we, but we want to make sure that we're putting it near compatible uses. We don't want to put this in, in somebody's backyard. We don't want to put this near other sensitive uses like, um, you know, a playground or a beach or something like that. We want this to be in an area with other compatible uses. So when we screened that, we got down to about five locations, all of which are in the industrial park. The industrial park seems to be well suited uh, for a recycling center. The parcels up there are a good size. They're generally dry. There's not a lot of wetlands. Um, they're easy access to Route 24. Um, and they, I said they're, they're north of Vulgar Marsh Road, so they're really sort of in the heart of where a lot of this recycling is going to get generated. So here, this is an overview plan of the industrial park. And I don't know if you can see the colors from there, but we looked at uh, a hand, there's five sites here that we looked at in the industrial park. These sites here in red, these are what we consider sort of the prime spots. So these have, they're flat, they're generally dry, they're a good size for a recycling center. Uh, ind individually, some of these sites are a little small, so we actually combined them with a couple of the adjacent sites. This one here, this is made up of actually three parcels. What we would do if we were to use this site is we would consolidate three parcels and then resubdivide them into two to provide a little bit more usable shaped site. These three parcels here, we would consolidate into one. That would give us a site that with, with a good size area to work with. Same with this one here. This is three sites combined, three parcels combined into one site. Now I mentioned these are sort of ideal sites. They exist right now on uh, Progress Road, which is a paved, constructed street um, in the industrial park, so we can get to these sites. But we also recognize there's, there's been some discussion that maybe these sites are too good for a recycling center, maybe they're too ideal, and that they would be better suited for a higher and better use. So we also looked at other sites in the industrial park that are sort of tucked away in the back. These sites here in blue are tucked away at the end of the road. Um, they're kind of away from the other uses in the industrial park. The downside of these sites are the roads are not yet constructed to these parcels. These roads in gray, these are what are called paper streets, meaning that they exist on paper, but they're not yet constructed, right? So to use these sites in blue, we would have to actually build a road out to those sites, which would be an added cost of building the constru uh, constructing the recycling center. So the cost to build a, a recycling center is probably going to be about $500,000. And that's based on a number of assumptions, it, meaning the, the types of materials that we would collect there, um, the size of the parcel that we would have to clear, um, is there going to be rock on the site? But generally speaking, $500,000 is probably a pretty good ballpark estimate for the con a construction of a simple recycling center. And that would be on one of the parcels, one of the more prime parcels, the ones that have frontage right now on a constructed street. If we had to build a, a recycling center on one of the parcels in the back that doesn't have frontage, we're probably looking at another $150,000 to $200,000 to bring the road to that site. And that would be just a very simple road. That wouldn't be, um, the roads in there now as designed, are they're paved and they have a number of utilities underneath them. For the recycling center, all we would do is probably run a gravel road out there um, without any utilities under it. Um, so that cost that $150,000 to $200,000 is just to run a gravel road out to some of these sites. So then the cost to operate and maintain uh, a recycling center, um, and again, this is based on a lot of different assumptions and, and variables, but we expect it to be around $100,000 a year. And that assumes that this recycling center is going to be open three days a week. Um, one of those days would be Saturday. So right now, uh, any day that it's open, you would have to have an attendant there just sort of monitoring things, making sure things are getting put in the correct bins. Uh, on Saturdays, you would want to have two, because Saturdays tend to be very, very busy um, at these types of recycling centers. As you know, if you go to the landfill on a Saturday, it's much busy. It's much busier than any other day of the week. We would expect the recycling center to be that way also. So Saturdays, we would have two attendants. Uh, the other two days of the week, we'd have one. So there was, that's one of the assumptions we made when we priced this out. Also, we made some assumptions about what types of materials would be accepted here. Um, 
you know, so depending on what actually gets constructed, how many days a week it's open, and what types of materials we bring in, this number could change a little bit, but we think it's probably about $100,000 a year. Now that $100,000 a year is included in the $1.5 million that I already presented for the, the annual cost. So that's already included in that 1.5. We are working with the town right now to, to see if there's options or see if there's um, places where we could save money on the, on the O&M and the construction. And that's something that we're working through right now. Like I said, we're looking at different combinations of materials that we can accept and what's better to leave on the curb versus bring to the recycling center, how that affects costs. So we're working through some of those numbers right now. So the next steps for the town is to identify exactly what level of service is desired for both the curbside pickup program and the recycling center. What mix of materials do we want to pick up at the curb versus what we take to a recycling center? So to sort of hone in on that level of service is the next step. And then to finalize it's to really identify which site we want to use for the recycling center and then begin the layout and the permitting process uh, for that center. That's, that's my presentation. So thank you, Tim. Um, we're going to open it up now to you for questions, uh, comments, your thoughts, your suggestions. Uh, so please feel free to come up to the microphone. I see Joe Sousa's on his way up already. And uh, we'll do the best we can. Um, in addition to the council, I know that many of you know Jan, our town administrator, and you've just met Tim. Um, but if you haven't been lucky enough to meet our DPW director, Rick Rogers, he's up here as well to help and answer your questions. My name is Joe Souza, 49 Hancock Street. First, I'd like to address the engineer if I could. Uh, can you tell us approximately how many landfills Par Engineer has closed over the years? It's a lot. Um, we've done dozens of landfills. We've probably closed every municipal landfill in Rhode Island that existed at one point. Can you tell me how old those landfills were? Most of these closed for decades or years or months? How long were they closed? Well, we just finished closing two landfills in Barrington, the town of Barrington. Landfills three and four, we just closed. Landfill four, actually, we just finished closing this summer. And they had been closed for decades, right? They had been closed for quite a while, yep. So pretty much most of the landfills in Rhode Island, from what I'm reading, were closed for more than five to eight years, some 20 years, some 30 years. Like one in Portsmouth was closed in the 70s. They're still capping it now. We, we've also been involved in a number of the, the cell closures over at Central Landfill. Well, I'll tell you where I'm going with this. When I read the letter saying that we would close the landfill within two years, and I'm thinking the last time we did GPS mapping, we found out the landfill was still sinking. And I'm talking about the hill that's been closed for, what, five years? Four years now, that front hill? It's been covered sure. in dirt, and it's still sinking. So if we close that and we get a sinkhole, we have to pay to open it up again and fill it. We have to open the cap up again. That's a lot of money. And that's why I can't understand why we, we accept the letter that would say we would close it in two years when we should wait at least five or eight years. So the, the way landfills are, are filled and the way they're capped is there's expectation that there will be settlement, but that the settlement will not be enough to create a sinkhole. So when we, when we do the final grading of the landfill, we keep the pitch positive enough, you're right, steep enough, that if we do get a uh, settlement, it doesn't settle enough to create a low spot in the landfill. And that's by design. That's, there are certain requirements that we have to meet to prevent that exact scenario from happening, to have that low spot from forming. So do we get a guarantee that's, that's like, you know, not going to, you know, it's warranted, we're not going to have to pay for a repair if that fails? <laughs> I, I don't think so, do we? There's, no. there's, there's never any, every landfill is a little different. And, and every settles, landfill but. around the state pretty much waited almost over a decade or more to close. Oh, that's, I believe that. that's enough on that point. All right. Uh, the cost blew me away when you said a half million dollars to build it because when we were looking at this before with the landfill committee that I was attending some meetings, uh, they were looking at a lot right there behind the public works garage. And we were looking at about $75,000 to build it. 
And the reason was it was cheaper was we were looking at a way to get rid of the yard waste over at LAL on Eagleville Road, who does mm -hmm. composting and they do it, they get, you know, I've been doing it for decades over there and they could take our yard waste. Now up on the island, Rhode Island Nursery takes the yard waste and they turn it in and when they take a tree out, they use it to, uh, with uh, dirty, uh, 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 clean fill and they make topsoil to fill in the holes where they took the trees out. So, I mean, there has to be a way we can get rid of that yard waste right there at ALAL. Now, I know we're in a lawsuit with them. They want a composting permit. Why the town hasn't gave it to them, I don't know. It's stupidity. In my opinion, we should be working with LAL. They could help us solve a lot of the problems we're having as far as getting rid of some of this waste. The all right, you mentioned that the town may have to have an additional truck for picking up trash. Mm -hmm. All right, well, if you go back originally, and the reason I couldn't understand why we were even looking at a transfer station is the town takes in approximately 30 yards of waste a day, five days a week. Okay, all right. The dumpsters that transport from a transfer station are 100 yards. Correct. So it's going to take more than three days to fill a dumpster. Well, you're going to send it up on the third with 10 yards short because you can't have it stinking over there for three days and GM wouldn't allow it anyway. So why we even looked at a transfer station to do track transfer, I don't know. What we looked at originally was behind the public works garage to use this, this, to build a, pretty much basically what we built at the landfill and use the uh, stackable cement block, which are, I forget what, six by eight or whatever mm -hmm. they are, you know, and build the high area where people could pull up in the dumpsters below, pave the area where people drive, and, you know, stone the rest or whatever. I mean, we looked at $75,000, so, and that's more what I think I'd want to vote for on, as a budget committee member. Okay. But my biggest question to you is, and please look at it, are we going to be okay to close that landfill that fast? And I know you're saying that we're going to do all this. But I also know that you're doing all that over landfills that were closed for decades. In the center of that landfill, where we're filling now, filling in the road, I mean, that's just going to go so that So you know, so the landfill will be closed in phases. Um, we will start with the older sections first, the, the, the ones that have yeah. largely completed their decomposition process, and we will move to the, the areas that are being filled now. Those will be done later. So those will be done probably two to three years after the landfill has actually been closed. Like I said, I hope we get a warranty with it. Do I have to come down there to talk? Yes, please, if you don't mind, just that way everyone can hear your question. Uh, Peter Monas, 83 Captain Circle. Um, you're not talking about a tra um, transfer station like Portsmouth has. That's out of the picture. But you're going to have a recycling center, maybe. Now, on the recycling, we have uh, pickups, trash, and recycling now. The recycling material that they pick up now, will that go to Johnston still? Correct. The recycling, the mixed recycling on the curb will go to Johnston. Right. So your only concern about your uh, recycling in town be white goods, uh, I mean, materials and what you mentioned. Yep. Have you put an R RFP out for uh, some company to uh, maybe pick up that stuff and take it away right away or pick it up? So we have, we have spoken to the current contractor who picks yeah, up. I know. Yep. Well, that too. But you can tell me. But my point is, have you put an RFP to see if there are interested parties to pick up this other trash that might be piled up in town at the industrial park, which is probably not a good idea. We've not put an RFP out that I'm aware of. Well, yeah, I think you should consider that, because like uh, it was already mentioned, LAA, L -A -L, or the, on Eagleville Road, one time they wanted to do a recycling center there, and it was turned down, I believe, and for some factors, but maybe it could be rehashed if they did some improvements there too. Um, so, if you do have a 
a collection point for white goods, how long is it going to stay on uh, industrial park? You're going to have somebody come on and pick it up too again, get rid of it? Correct. So the way it would work is they would get collected in a, in a bin or a container, much like they do at the top of the landfill now. Somebody would come to remove the refrigerants and yeah. some of those white goods. And then a company that comes in and just does white goods recycling would come in and take them away. So they're good candidates for uh, maybe picking this stuff up directly or taking it to that location directly. Uh, potentially, if they're not too, f you, you, are you suggesting instead of bringing them to a recycling center, in town. folks would bring them directly to that outlet? To the, the, the townspeople you're talking about or the, yeah, the town? I'm not, I'm not sure I understand the Well, question. you can have a pickup again, another truck maybe, once a month maybe, because yep. there's not going to be that much um, refrigerators, you know, it's going to fill up uh, right. overall. There are some, because they're big bulky items and they take a lot of room. But you could have a one particular month that you pick up the stuff or once a month and then send it to these uh, businesses. Correct. Like the um, salvage place in Westport, yep. maybe they'll take this stuff. Uh, so we so have I have a you know tie up a property on the industrial park, right. detrimental to the selling of those lots, and hiring all these uh, paying people to main three days, so how many hour man hours you're going to do there? Yep. Put up a building, you might have to have a building which you're going to maintain. It's a, a really a waste of money. You should try to get directly out of town once and for all instead of keeping it here and starting it here. So. So, you know, we did look at, at that as an option to have things like white goods, the bulky waste picked up directly at the curb, like you mentioned, maybe on a once a month basis, you know, six times a year, something like that. at some frequency at regularly scheduled, you know, days, they would come and pick up white goods or bulky waste. Right. You're not going to do it every week. That's for sure. Correct. Right? We wouldn't do it every week. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be cost effective. But, you know, to have a, a contractor come in and, and pick them up, like, like I said, maybe once a month. Yeah. You know, on a the second Tuesday of the month or something like and that. Then, and you got, then by the same time, you're having a uh, Department of Public Works workers at this location three, how many days a week now? Three, two times? With three, uh, three days a week is what we were thinking. Three, but that's uh, three, that's four man hours probably, right? Because yep. uh, that's a waste of time and money. So we, we looked at uh, two options. We looked at pushing everything is everything that we could to the curb, meaning... Bulky waste got picked up at the curb. White goods were picked up at the curb. Um, yeah, it's bulky waste, white goods, and yard waste all right. picked up at the curb. Um, we looked at that as an option. And again, it was uh, mm. some schedule, some frequency that they would pick it up once a month, something mm. like that. Um, yard waste was picked up, I think, mm. I think we figured eight weeks out of the year they would pick up yard waste. Nine weeks out of the year they would pick up yard waste. So that was, that was an option that we looked at. Yeah. And when we priced it out, it came to be very close to that 1.5 million because well, what you're just you know so what you're paying for um you still have to pay for the disposal you still have to pay for on the white goods the cf the uh refrigerant removal mm. um but what you're also paying for there is you're paying for somebody to drive around town and pick them all up whereas if you have them at the recycling center mm. where you have residents drop it off at the recycling center you don't have that transport cost uh, to the recycling center i might add a question which i'm not sure, sure about if I were to take a refrigerator to uh, Westport Salvage Place there, um, would they charge me to take out the refrigerator? Yep. Okay. Uh, so, you know, people can do that. Mm -hmm. and, and then plus they might get some recyclable uh, uh, money for the trash they sell there to the place too. And maybe, uh, you know, they, uh, somebody, I think an RFP is, we should be put out to see if there's anybody interested in picking up this stuff and making a business out of it. Not, instead of having the town burning down with a recycling location in town, which is going to cost money, and it's just going to get uh, a negative way to do it. I think it's outsource it as soon as possible. Thank you. Peter, before you go, I just to clarify one thing, um, I, because I think your question is one of the fundamental decisions here. I mean, we could arrange for everything to be picked up at the curb by somebody, right? But if that happens, then that happens on a, you know, sort of defined schedule, a certain number of times a year. And there's some debate as to whether or not that's just automatically included or do you pay an extra fee if you need something picked up? 
People in Tiverton, though, are somewhat used to, with the luxury of the landfill, being able to get rid of things when they want to get rid of them. So the recycling center allows somebody who's, you know, moving or remodeling their house and wants to get rid of these things now to be able to get rid of them, as opposed to having to wait until the next scheduled pickup. So that's one of the questions. I mean, that's one of the things that we want people to think about and is the ability to have a recycling center that you can bring things to when you want to get rid of them, something that um, that you want to have. Well, I, and, and so I think it's a good point because it's sort of one of the, the basic issues here. The other thing just to keep in mind, and Jan can talk about this a little bit, is that I know that Jan has been investigating various other options. There are certain types of materials where there are third party companies that are interested in picking them up. And we might be able to work with some of them on certain types of materials where they'll come and take them for free from your, you know, from your curbside. Well, just to follow up that, I don't think the incidences are be very slim for like people moving out and be a, of course they're gonna be a junk to get rid of. And uh, the future, getting rid of, uh, let's say junk, is gonna be very costly for everybody. But again, if you get an RFP that you have somebody on call uh, willing to pick up these items and take it away and recycle them somewhere else, uh, that might be better, you know, a way to go. Get, get, get that information out, try it first, see what's cooking. And uh, maybe somebody will create a business. My name is Richard Dana, 16 Miles Ave. My question is about the landfill. Did you ever look at uh, recouping the gas run it through an engine, generate electricity? Uh, you know, we did a few years ago, we talked to um, some companies that do just that, they do landfill gas generation. And Tiverton actually produces so little trash on an annual basis that the volume, it was just not um, cost effective to try to recapture that. Um, it's a surprisingly small amount of methane that gets generated up there. Yeah, because the, where I worked in New Bedford for years, had the landfill there that's gonna generate electricity 20 years after it's capped. That's a lot of money. The guy's making 3.2 megawatts, 24 hours a day, seven days a week right now. Yeah. We, we had a, a gentleman call us a couple of years ago inquiring about just this, and he asked how much trash we were landfilling a year. Uh, and at the time, it was about four or 5,000 tons a year. He all but hung up on us. Yeah. <laughs> he I just wanted to make sure you looked yeah. at it. Yep. Sanford Mantel, 80 Budway. I have a few questions. Uh, first question I have, uh, the cost. I'm a little puzzled because basically we're going to be swapping out the landfill for the tipping fee. So it's almost a one-for-one -one swap. So the two additional costs are the transport and the recycle. That's considerably less than $1.5 million. What makes up the difference? So that the cost increases are going to be the cost that you're not paying right now is going to be the tipping fee like you said it's going to be the um the transport and it's going to be if we have an o a recycling center the o1m on the recycling center and but it doesn't get to 1.5 million i already included that so i have a breakdown unless i'm missing something sure let me just So the, the costs, so it's about, you know, it's about $730,000 a year for the curbside pickup program. The cost to transport to Central Landfill is about $120,000 a year. The cost for the O&M on the Recycling Center, like I said, is about $100,000. To pick up the bulky waste at the curb, we're talking about, and these are ballpark numbers I'm giving you, about nineteen grand. 
The tipping fee is about 310,000. You will have some landfill legacy costs that you will have to pay for, so the landfill. What um, are those? That's what I'm missing. That's about 50 grand a year, the landfill legacy costs. Okay. We assumed that the, that the town would borrow to, buy, to construct the landfill, uh, excuse me, the um, recycling center. And so the debt servicing on that, we estimated to be about 32 grand a year. And then you've got uh, the tipping fees for the things like the white goods, the bulky waste, the tires and the mattresses at Central Landfill, this is the char what they would charge. That's gonna be about 10 grand. And then the container rental um, and the transport for the tires and the mattresses, because those are special items, that would be about four grand. And then the yard waste program to pick up the yard waste, um, this is a higher estimate, uh, this is about 100 grand. Wasn't well, the town picking up the yard waste? So this, this assumes that this would get moved over to the um, private contractor. Now, if the town continued to pick it up, there's costs associated with that. It would be less than 100 grand, but for the, for the budgeting purposes, we assume that this would get picked up by the, the contractor. That gets us close. Okay, uh, those other pieces were missing. That was yep. the question I had. Okay, uh, a few other questions. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you were talking about uh, piggybacking with other towns for the uh, transfer station. Why was that not considered? Or why was it all oh, uh, overruled, I should say? Uh, so this was probably going on about eight years ago we looked at that. And it was dismissed at the time as being not, not feasible because the cost to build the transfer station you would have to, there was a couple of reasons. The cost to build the transfer station was, was very high, like, like um, the council president said, it's probably about two million bucks to build it. Well, um, excuse, just uh, don't other towns have transfer stations already in use? They do, so the thought was, if you're talking about looking- I'm, I'm talking about using a transfer station that's existing in another town, yep. not building a new one with another town, but using one for another, to, yep. with so another we, town. So we did look at that at the time. We looked, for example, we looked at sending the trash to Portsmouth. And at the time, this was seven or uh, eight years ago, Portsmouth did not have the capacity to take Tiverton's trash. Um, the next closest one would be Newport, and Newport um, didn't have the capacity to take this. And then once you get, start getting further out from that, um, the cost, the cost, you know, the cost yeah. of trucking. Okay. Is, well, I thought capacity was an issue, but I would just wanted to verify that. Yep. Okay. Another question: uh, recycling. Same same question. Do other towns have recycling centers? They do. Uh, no, what's the capacity? In other words, uh, how long does recycling material stay in a recycling center? It, depending on the material. Some material is collected, you know, aggregated quicker because it's a higher volume. Things like mixed recycling lasts, you know, thinking about Barrington Landfill, I mean, excuse me, Barrington um, Recycling Center, you know, they might move that mixed recycling out every week. Um, but then their white goods and their e-waste might not get moved out for a month or two months. So again, uh, probably a capacity issue with sharing with another town? Uh, probably, yeah. So okay. a lot of those communities, yes, I would say so. Okay, yeah. all right, it's reasonable. Uh, okay, I got the product. Uh, I think I've got all my questions. In. Well, I, had, I have a, this is a out of the box question, okay? Uh, really way out of, off the wall, but uh, why can't individuals bring the trash to the to the uh, center themselves rather than having it picked up? Bring trash to the. I bring my own trash. Little Compton brings their own trash. To people bring their own trash. Why can't everybody in Tiverton do? I'm I'm not saying we should. I'm just asking why. That's the biggest cost in this whole setup. So why can't we do that? Bring why isn't to, that an option? Bring it to Central Landfill. No, bring it right. to a transfer. In other words, if you want, it, if you build a transfer station, yep. okay, the cost of that would be offset by having people bring their own trash rather than picking it up. So you Is that feasible? You know, we hadn't really considered that as an option. Well, again, it's not a, yep. it's, it's not a box so option, but- one uh, of the one of the, the, the capital cost, again, going back eight years, the capital cost to build the transfer station, the thought was at the time, if we build a transfer station, we are committed to spend that kind of money on a facility like that, we are committed to using that transfer station for the next 20 years or more, right? That's a big commitment. Um, if we decide after two years that this transfer station is not working out, we're not getting the volume that we need to make it cost effective, or people dropping it off, or the, the, the trash trucks dropping off is just not working out, we can't, we can't divorce ourselves from that transfer station. We're, we're kind of stuck with it. So one of the thoughts back then was 
go with a, a, a curbside pickup program and a direct haul to the landfill. If that program doesn't work out, if you decide at that point you don't want to do it, you haven't spent that kind of capital cost like you did on the transfer station, you can invest in something else. At that point, you could relook at a transfer station and maybe build it at that oh, point. Oh, yeah, that was just an out-of-the-box yeah. uh, thought, just something, you know, just sure. thinking uh, in terms of as an option. I don't know if it's considered, but it's just an option. Yep. But also, one of the things you mentioned uh, that's in here, and that's really a valid point, uh, continuing the uh, pay-as-you-throw program will actually contribute quite a bit of funds to offset the cost of this program. But that's an, again, that's an option people should think about. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Hi, I'm Vicki Revere. I'm the Lytic Committee Chair. And uh, we have a lot of concerns because um, once the landfill is tapped or closed, we are going to see everything all over town. We know that. We see it now. People hiding things in wooded areas. We're cleaning up on a daily basis. I highly recommend that recycling center. Um, my family and I have a house on Shelter Island in New York. It's been working for decades. People bring it when they want to bring it down there, and things are not all over the island. So I'm really here just to advocate for the recycling center and um, keep the pay as you throw. Um, because now the garbage is contained before we had them in small bags and they were all over the town. And the other thing I'd like to advocate for are the mandatory um, bins on wheels that they pick up with the garbage cans because that really um, prevents a lot of the garbage from falling out on the roads. And, uh, <laughs> and those are the three things that I just wanted to bring to everybody's attention because it, we've been together as a group, we're all here for the last 10, 15 years and five of us can't keep the town clean but we're doing all we can um, to educate from the grammar schools all the way up and I'm hoping that the recycling center and the pay as you throw stay in place. Thank you. Um. Ma Madam President, can I just ask your name again? Excuse me, I'm sorry. Could I just get your name again? Oh, thank you, Vicki. I just want to add to what you were saying. Um, I think you made it a good point, and um, I do a lot of walking around town, and I'm always astounded when you walk down a very pretty street and you see a TV just thrown on the mm -hmm. side of the road and stuff. So thank you for raising yeah, We have that. about 40 um, families on the adopt an area, and it's mm -hmm. just let, letting us know what areas of town are being covered. Yep. Um, one day I was, I'm, I live on Bridal, so there's an, a swamp area, and I was moving some speakers and some TVs to the other side of the road so my husband could put them in the truck and bring them to the dump. And um, somebody stopped me and said, how dare you dump on our land? And no one else gets caught when they do it. And here I am trying to get into one area to remove it. Go figure, right? I but hear you, you, but thank you for doing what you you're do. You're welcome. And join our Adopt an Area. We'd love to ha find out what area you're covering as well. Thank you. Thank you. Just to follow up on one of the things that Vicki said, I mean, amongst the considerations, too, is the possibility of, um, of saving money by going to biweekly recycling. I mean, these are all things that the town administrator's been looking into instead of recycling pickup every single week biweekly or the possibility of the large bins. Um, the, these are, you know, all things that are being looked at. So if you have thoughts and opinions, now's your chance. Just to expand on that, because I could see how someone gets concerned about biweekly recycling. Um, it, it doesn't have to reduce the rate of recycling. Uh, typically, that gets done when you have larger bins rather than the ones that we currently use here in Tiverton. This is just being implemented in Warren. It's going pretty well. I mean, the bins are so large that some people will want to exchange them for, for smaller bins, but they can easily accommodate two weeks' worth of recyclables in most cases. Madam President, I have a question on the bi-weekly recycling piece, which I'm sure some people are probably wondering about. What's changed in the last three years since we looked at this, the recycling committee, when I was on it, looked at this, made a recommendation that we go out, purchase all the bins from waste management, sign a contract with them, and uh, we were accosted by the residents of this town. Um, I, I just don't know if that's a worthwhile thing to bring up again 
given what happened two years ago? Well, I can answer a little bit. Um, two things have happened. One, um, and I've heard this from some other communities, which is the Johnston landfill, um, which is getting pickier and pickier about um, recycling, has started rejecting recycling loads, not just because people have the wrong things in there, but because they're wet. So um, there are loads that are going to Johnston from some communities that have been rejected because the recycling day pickup was a wet day, so all the newspaper and the cardboard and everything that's in there is wet, and they're rejecting those. And when they reject recycling, um, they make you put it into the regular landfill part, and they charge you by the ton the tipping fees. So a whole load of wet stuff weighs a lot and it costs a lot of money. So that's one thing. The other thing is I think there was a lot of concern in the community the last time about the size of the really big bins, and some folks felt very uncomfortable with that. But apparently now there's a smaller version of that bin that also has the lid on it so things would stay dry with you know but they're not they're not as big so you if you really felt that you wanted a smaller bin because the big bin was just too unwieldy for you to manage you could do that i'm not saying this is a for sure i'm just saying that there are things that have happened i mean we'd have to look into the costs and figure out how to pay for it just like before but um you know, since we're doing this, I think now's a good time to put everything on the table and look at it. I, mean, I think that's a good point, but at the same time, I would just make sure the administrator, I don't believe the administrator was here when we had this discussion. It would be worthwhile to go back and review the tapes because, you know, there were those of us who advocated for bringing those into town and we were all but crucified for pushing that forward. And, and here's a member, member of the recycling committee who can back me up. Hi, Jeff Belli, Two Part Street. As Mr. Edwards had said, I've been trying to fight to get us to go automated since I've been put on the recycling committee. And every year I've been rejected because the excuse I've been getting is people in the south end of town that have long driveways want to put their, be able to put their bins in the back of their car and drive them to the end of the driveway. Well, I don't know if the people on this council have been made aware of. We've had an ongoing issue with our trash collection people. It started with Patriot and it's still going on with Mega. I've even tried to address this issue myself. They're, they're crossing the road into oncoming traffic to pick up trash and to pick up the recycling bins into oncoming traffic. If one of these trucks gets head on collision with a car, somebody's gonna be on the hook for the, for the lawsuit. The only solution, there's only two solutions to solve that problem. Either we finally say enough's enough and we go automated and that's it. And if the people don't want to be a part of it, they can get their own private contractors or we redo our schedules for trash pickup to where one side of the town is one day and the other side on, this, on, a, on a street, I'm, I'm gonna clarify. On one side of, on main road, so that the trucks aren't crossing the street to pick up the trash on the, into the oncoming traffic. You'd have one side of the street on Main Road on a Tuesday. You'd have the opposite side of the street on Wednesday. That way the trash ain't, you know, the opposite side isn't there and they're forced. Or we go automated, like I've been saying for years, the arm is only on one side of the truck so he has no reason to cross the road. You know, we, the, 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 big, the bigger bins is the way to go, and it keeps the trash off our roads, out of our, you know, and, you know, even the, with the bigger bins now, the, the trash people are picking them up and slamming them down, and they're breaking them. My bin that I had on wheels has already been broken. I've already had to go out and buy a new one myself because I, I know they don't, there's no more at the town hall or at public works. We have to go automated because, you know, the trash collection people, and even if we do have these bins and they're not automated, the people that are picking the trash cans up, I have video of it. 
and I've shown it to Jim Gonsalo when he was the town administrator. They pick it up and they slam it back down on the ground. When they have the arms right there on the truck to pick it up by using the truck, because I've seen them use it. Some guys will use it, some guys won't. We need to start looking and, you know, plus there's more cost. I don't know if everybody here has looked at it. I know some people that are on the recycling committee, we have looked at it because we have seen the breakdown from when the contracts go out. It is cheaper to go to the automated system because now the contractor is not having to pay to have an employee there that could possibly get hurt by the, by the trash when he goes to pick it up. It's a machine picking it up. It's actually cost less to go to the automated than it is to go to what we have now. But every time the contract comes up for renewal, everybody on the council wants to stay with the trash the way we have it now, which costs more. This council needs to start thinking into the, you know, let's get into the 21st century and start picking up our trash like everybody else. Portsmouth has gone automated, I'm pretty sure. You know, Middletown has definitely gone automated. Newport has gone semi-automated to where they still have the guys on the back of the truck, but they're using the trucks to pick the bins up. You know, the other thing I would like to ask this council that I know it has come up in our the recycling committee's thing, and I just confirmed it with the, the chairman on the recycling committee, and I would just like to verify this with this existing council. The money from the pay as you throw once, once the landfill's closed, what we have discussed is that the money from the pay as you throw bags is going to go to fin because we are going to have to pull, get a bond to close this landfill because we don't have enough money in the account right now. Pay as you throw is going to go to finish paying off that note and to cover the cost because we're on the hook for monitoring that na landfill if I'm correct, for the next 30 years. Am I correct? Cor correct. There, there will be a, a minimum 30-year obligation to monitor uh, the landfill once it's closed. So the pay as you throw, the money from the pay as you throw is probably not going to be able to offset any type of cost, you know, for trash collection. Because that is going to, a lot of it's going to be going towards to pay off the bond, to close the landfill as well as to pay the monitoring on the wells. May I, may I say something? Uh, we have a slightly different opinion here I, about that. If Tim could maybe sure. explain that. Well, I, I'll go get Don. I to, so the, I the land. To say oh. Donna asked, so. Yeah. No, I had, um, Jeff, I had already talked to, uh, as far as the uh, bags so as pay as you throw. I had, in the last uh, August 13th, I had called uh, Mr. Uh, Thies uh, about the fact that in the cost, it, it wasn't added in, which is $425,000 that is collected. And it's kind of a different animal because you're collecting the money and it's a cost, but then it's also revenue. So it's revenue put into a restricted account to be used towards the closure and we're short two million dollars correct so you would have to continue the pay as you throw because that was the promise that was made to the public that if we had enough money that you wouldn't have to do the pay as a throw anymore but we're like two years short of or more of the amount of money $10 million to actually close. That's what the, the amount that I had heard. So you'd still be paying uh, the, the $425,000 would have to go into the cost right now to continue pay as a throw, to continue so you can have all of the money to close the uh, landfill. Correct. Now, I guess the problem comes up is, well, are you going to continue with pay as a throw for $425,000 a year when you've hit that amount to close the landfill? And I would say that that would be then a tax, an unfair tax 
that was not the promise to the people. So it's kind of a conundrum. It said that to keep the landfill closed would be $50,000. That's what I'm seeing here to monitor it. So I, I don't know what the end is going to be, but as soon as you get the $10 million, I think we have to reassess what we're going to do as far as pay as you throw because we made a promise that that was what it was for, and I think that cost would have to go away. Because other than that, you're, you're charging people twice. You're collecting money through taxes for the trash program. Correct. And then you're, you're then taxing again for the pay as the throw, and you already have the money. So that's a double tax. So I, I'm not for double taxing, so I don't know what's going to be what that should be at this at this time um if i could just ask uh par the engineer from par what will be the co what's going to be the cost yearly after the landfills closed that we're on the hook for for 30 years we we think right now it's probably in the the range of about fifty thousand dollars a year uh for monitoring so and if go ahead. and if we do have to get a loan you know pull out a you know get a bond why are we getting a bond? Well, if we had to close this landfill tomorrow, we would have to get no, a bond no. for $2 million. No. You say, well, you're saying it's going to cost us $10 million well, to we close have, the landfill. We have over $8 million. So what right. wasn't figured in when I was talking to uh, Tim, I hope you don't mind I call you, Tim, was t to say that in the, in, the, in the cost that was given to me, at the time in August when we were deciding what to do, that that had kind of be left out. I think he was figuring that we already had the money and I asked him and he, I guess they hadn't really thought about that. But we didn't have the full amount for the closure. We don't have to get a bond. You just have to, we got over eight, well after this year, we'll even have more money. But we are short. But right, we we're gonna have. have to, we shouldn't have to get a bond. We just have to continue the pay as you throw till we get the full amount. But then we've got that conundrum of: Are we going to double tax? Madam President, can I address? Uh, sort of uh, actually taking up on what Donna is saying at that August 13 meeting. I think that Donna raised that issue, and Justin Katz at that point indicated that there are ways to deal with that. Maybe the people get a reduction in property taxes. So I think there are ways to deal with yeah, this. Yes, we would have to discuss it. But Jan. Jan. Just briefly about the, the pay as you throw. Um, <clears throat> I think the estimate of, or the ballpark estimate of what currently is being generated, 425,000, that's net off uh, the cost of the bags. So um, I just want to correct that. Secondly, uh, pay as you throw does a couple of things. One is it generates money so that we can pay for the closure of the landfill. Also, very importantly, it helps recycling. It's a huge factor in how much we recycle. The more right. we recycle, excuse me, the more we recycle, the less we have to truck to the landfill. So it has multiple aspects. And we can say that, you know, certain things were said, you know, years ago. And it's not to say that we should make easy decisions, you know, or reverse earlier decisions easily, but we do need to think about what are we currently facing? You now have new numbers on what solid waste management, trash pickup, hauling and recycling is going to cost. You have different options to pay for that. One option is to continue pay as you throw, and once it has paid for the landfill closure, or if that account gets topped off in a different way, which is another possibility, uh, you could continue that program, continue the benefit for the recycling, which reduces the amount of waste we have to take to the central landfill, and it, it's just one option, and I, I think it should not be dismissed out of hand uh, because it can really help actually get us to a affordable uh, way to pay for what we need to provide. In future well, the good thing, correct. Pay as you throw has been, you know, a shining light to get people to recycle more, and more communities are starting to do it. Um, you know, which is a great thing. The the major thing, though, if we are going to go that route, is 
the ever the thing where the reason pay as you throw was started was on the premise that the money from pay as you throw was to go into a, res a restricted account to to pay for the closure of the landfill period which is what has been happening we correct through to that the question is whether we ever want to reconsider anything that we've decided in the past or not the the one thing though which your predecessors have learned the hard way if you do not put something any type of account in this town if you do not put a restricted on that account the money will be siphoned for something else that's why that account and every time we've tried to use that money to help the town to have it as sort of like a small loan it we it's been flat out mainly denied because of the original restriction put on the account if of all these years that was not a restricted account we would not be even as close as we are that money would have been gone thank you thank you Jeff but all of this discussion about pays you throw I think is an is an interesting one um, and, and yes, that was the original intent and it's worked fairly well in that we're close to having to close the landfill and we're relatively close to having that amount, you know, almost the $10 million that we need. But a couple of things to keep in mind is the landfill won't get closed in one felt swoop. It won't happen in a day. So, um, so the money that we'll, we'll need, we don't necessarily need to have every single penny of it in November of 2020 because it will happen over a period of time. Um, but it is interesting in terms of um, whether or not you fund the landfill closure in potentially a different way and, and as Jan mentioned, there is a real benefit in terms of the amount of recycling to keeping pay as you throw because if you don't have pay as you throw, our recycling rates just plummet. They just do. We saw that. Um, it makes a huge difference. And, you know, in some other communities that have um, curbside pickup, for example, in Middletown, in Middletown, you, they you have curbside pickup, but, and they have pay as you throw bags. But it also is $141 a year per household to enroll. So, you know, some of the cost of of the program is, you know, spread to people who use the program. I'm not suggesting that we do that. I'm just saying that that's an interesting comparison with the Pay As You Throw program because it is potentially long term a way to help defray some of the costs of trash pickup with the benefit of recycling but of course you know there was a decision there's a restricted account that can't be changed without the will of the people um, but it is I think worth considering to help smooth the cost of this program going forward anybody else from the audience any com anybody else Good evening. Uh, my name is John Cello. I'm a former resident of Barrington, Rhode Island, just moved here. Uh, I'm still, I'm new and I'm still trying to understand how this whole program works, but just to re uh, talk on the recycling center, in Barrington alone, uh, that recycling center is open Mondays, Tuesdays, uh, Thursdays and Friday, Saturday, and half day on Sunday. Uh, they recycle everything from metal, glass, paper, cardboard, uh, yard waste. They also have uh, containers that do electronics, computers, TVs, uh, let's see what else, uh, fluorescent lights, CFRs, and uh, also plastic bags. And uh, what I've seen there living at the town for the last 25 years is uh, the recycling program. Uh, the town really makes an effort to get that recycling situated. 
Uh, those bins fill up probably every week, uh, a good 100 yard, dump, uh, yard dumpsters. But also with the composting is they have an area for composting that they recycle the yard waste. They also give that yard waste to the residents a certain amount, I think it's uh, 40 pounds, and then the rest of it goes to a private contractor that they sell uh, back and take the proceeds from that to recoup uh, to the town. So if you're looking to do something of that sort, I would definitely recommend it. Uh, my question is, uh, I have gone to the landfill down to the southern part of the town. Uh, why haven't you considered putting the recycling center there since it's already there, so to speak? Uh, I can answer that. Yep. Um, so once the landfill is capped, yep. um, we won't be able to do any of that kind of activity on the landfill cap. All it's right. a it's an engineered system that um, we have to be very careful about what we do on top of it. Um, the edges, the areas around the landfill cap that won't be capped. Yes. Um, there's just not enough space available right. for a recycling center. We did look at it. Okay. Um, it's just there's not enough space outside of that cap area to accommodate what we would want to do. Barrington did the same thing. There, they actually had uh, the one, two, three, I believe four different landfills. Yep. Uh, it's the third and fourth that actually have where the recycling center is, yep. and it's relatively a small footprint. So, yep, uh, I'm actually very familiar yep. with uh, with okay. Barrington's recycling right. center, um, and that is uh, right in the corner of their land, what we call landfill number four. four yep. um, and it is it is actually outside of the landfill okay. cap. Um, it's a very well-run program for sure. Um, they do a very good job with their recycling program. They do manage most of that yard waste. Um, at a different facility. Correct. And that's why they're able to keep that footprint as yep. small as it is. Um, like I had mentioned earlier, the really the space driver here on the size of the lot mm -hmm. is the yard waste. That okay. takes up a, a, a big footprint okay. um, to manage that. All right. Um, all right. Thank you. Appreciate it. <clears throat> Just one other thing about the yard waste. It's been brought up a couple of times, and I want to just emphasize that we're still looking at you know, what options may be available to the town. Um, we have some time. We obviously would rather be able to make final decisions sooner rather than later, but some of these things we continue to look at. There are people interested in taking yard waste from the town. The question is, what would the arrangement look like? Where would it go? Uh, do they have a good track record and everything else? So we're seriously looking into that. And that could still affect uh, the scope of a recycling center and the, the size of the lot that we need. Um, just so that people know, we're, we're taking that seriously. We're looking at other options. Hi, good evening. Tom Rambitowski, 17 Baldwin Road. Uh, just a couple of comments on pay as you throw. I know the initial discussion, we've gone over that, but uh, I think we, we do need to consider the benefits and some of which haven't been mentioned. We know it cuts down on the amount of trash which is good because every pound of trash we send there we pay for, whereas the recycling, we don't have a tipping fee for that. So we've got to keep that up if we want to save money. Otherwise, we're just going to be shifting costs to paying the tipping fee uh, if we don't do that. And I think uh, President Hilton's right that the recycling rates in other towns drop or they just don't exist if you don't have the bags for whatever reason because people feel it directly and they can reduce the cost by increasing their recycling. The other thing is, the way they charge you at Johnston, they look at the percentage your recycling is of your total waste stream. And if you fall below some number, I forget what the number is, your tipping fees go up. So it's another reason to keep the recycling going because not only do you want to minimize what you're sending, but you've got to keep that ratio right. And I think they keep increasing the amount of recycling that they want in that ratio over time. And the only way they've found to be effective for towns to keep up with that or to not get penalized by that is through some kind of program of that sort. So I think we're going to have to keep it long term in some way. As to how it's financed, where the money goes, that's a discussion to have. The other comment I'd like to make is if we do go to the bins that the truck picks up by itself, then the pay as you throw might have to be modified because the driver will not be able to determine what's in the bin, whether it's in the right bag, whether people have paid for that or not. The towns that have that tend to have that fee that was mentioned. For example, you get a bin 
and you pay $200 a year to have that bin out in front of your house and it gets picked up. You don't need bags anymore. It's whatever fits in the bin at each collection time and it's covered by some sort of yearly fee. So that would probably have to be instituted if we keep the pay-as-you-throw, which I would, I would recommend, but also go to the trucks that have the arm that automatically picks things up. Uh, thanks. Hi, Diane Farnworth. Um, the, the, the last gentleman made a lot of great points and with regard to the pay-as-you-throw program. I, I know a number of people over the years, and this is certainly a conversation for later, but a number of people over the years have complained about the quality of the bags that we're currently using. Um, a, a new idea that has come is perhaps instituting a sticker program as opposed to the bags. Uh, but certainly, again, that's something to talk about down the road as part of future decision making. The question I have is with regard to curbside pickup of bulky waste and white goods. Is that free today um, to residents? And would it be free under this program? Or would there be fees associated with that? The bulky wastes are not free. The white goods, if they do not have free on, are free. Okay. So um, I would assume that any curbside pickup of such items would include fees? Uh, the way we're programming it right now in, in this example that we provided, it assumes that it's, it would be built into the, um, the annual program. So it would be like it, they would come every month or every, once every two months, and it would be built into your, um, like your annual costs uh, to have the bulky waste picked up. You could do a program where it's by appointment and you pay, like the, for example, the way my town does it is I call in advance, they come to my house, I, they charge me $25 and they pick up you know, the couch that I left out. And, and I think personally that's fair. Yep. You know, it, it's saving me from having to get a dumpster every yep. time I want to get rid of things. Yep. So uh, you know, I think that's just something to yep. make sure that everyone is aware of that that's very likely possible. And that was, oh, the other thing I wanted to mention, I, I know there's been some discussion over these arms on the trucks. Our current contractor has these arms and they actually use them. Um, I've, I've seen them in front of my house recently because I do have the wheeled barrels and uh, I've seen them actually, they open it up, they put it in the back of the truck and up it goes. So it's, it's kind of already in use a little bit. Just wanted to point it out, thank you. Anybody else? So since all of you were nice enough to come out tonight, how about we ask you to draw a poll here? Recycle Center, yes? Show of hands. See? This is what happens when you come and get to vote. All right. Um, if there aren't any more questions, then I'm going to just ask the council if, um, if anybody's got any questions or comments or thoughts um, on the council as well as Jan or Excuse me, just, uh, Rick. Just, just one question. Uh, isn't the Johnson landfill going to close soon? I think it has about 20 years. I, I think their estimate is about 20 years in the Johnston landfill. That's, that's correct. <laughs> Which, by the way, is another interesting yeah. reason about why not to build a full transfer station because at some point the state is going to have to come up with another plan and that might even involve letting us take our trash somewhere besides Johnston like maybe to some place in Massachusetts there we go all right madam president yes, John. so I have a number of questions if that's okay yes, please. all right so um, first off Tim I want to thank you for coming out um, I was on the council for two years. I was on the recycling or the landfill subcommittee for all two years. Uh, this is the first time I've ever, met, I've ever met anybody from PAR, so thank you for, for coming. Um, I was looking at the analysis that you put together, and I had a couple of questions. Um, 
first off, when we look at the recycling center operations and maintenance costs, during the presentation, you mentioned that uh, there would be no need for electricity at the site, yet we've got a budget line item in here estimated for $1,200 for electricity. How, how come that's there? Uh, well, I think what I said was we wouldn't be running some of the utilities down there. Uh, and what that would be, in the, in the industrial park right now, those roads are programmed uh, with water, sewer, natural gas, um, a number of buried utilities. Gotcha. So I, we I wouldn't need yeah. those. But electricity, we would we would bring down. Okay, just want to make sure. Um, and then the second item was on the cost for the attendance. Um, do we know if that's an actual true cost, or are we just throwing a number on there? I'm sorry, say that again. Is that an actual? Yeah, the cost for the attendance. That's that's. I have an to aspect. imagine. The, I mean, there's you know that it's gonna that looks like a salary number to me, but not the total cost of benefits and such. So what I I mean, we made an assumption about what the salary would be, and then we added a percentage to that to cover benefits. Um, it's a, it's just an estimate at this point. Okay. So, yeah, may I ask one question about that though? No. Is that a little bit of a wash with the attendance though? This it, this isn't a necessarily a new cost. This is a basically you're moving folks who are now working at the landfill to the recycling center. Correct. Correct. We so, so we yep. It, that's not really a it, it's an operating cost, but it's not. Well, it's new. Not, you're it's just not. moving. I'll point out why. You're moving personnel from one location yeah. to another, right? So, so that actually leads. That, that I thank you for that because it leads me into my next question, which on the handout, what the future holds, um, it talks about the service, the current landfill operations. You've got a figure here of about three hundred and thirty-six thousand dollars, but that's not the true cost of operating a landfill uh, because the landfill does take in revenue. Uh, every time you go up there, if you have a barrel, it's five dollars. If you have two barrels, it's ten. If you have a, you know, truck full of yard waste, it's twenty-five. So there is revenue, and net net, that number is much lower than three thirty-six. So, for us to put that number out and say the current annual operating costs are about a million dollars, a little over a million dollars as it stands today, we're losing a revenue stream when we close this landfill that we're not going to recoup when we open the uh, when we when we open the recycling center. Correct? There, there is revenue, but basically what we do is what costs us money, for instance, tires, bulky waste, things like that, that cost us money to get rid of, then we charge mattress, soiled mattresses. So it's to a great extent a wash and in fact, things like yard waste cost a little bit of money because people can drop it off for free along with uh, you know, six bags that we might pick up on uh, nine trips a, a year. Well, so I'm a little confused then because if I'm paying $5 for a barrel, which is a dollar more than the cost of a pay-as-you-throw bag, and I didn't buy a pay-as-you-throw bag, I chose to pay at the landfill and pay an additional dollar more, that's additional revenue that the town's not going to capture. And as somebody who goes to the landfill on a regular basis, there is a number of town residents that go up there, and they're all writing checks or handing cash over. So I think that you know we'd have to know what the true net cost of operating the landfill is before we put a comparison figure out there for the public, because there is going to be a, a revenue stream that we are going to lose as a town. Yeah, and that's something we might be able to get, obviously, from the treasurer. It's not a significant number the, because the black bags that you have to pay to get rid of at the landfill are offset because it's not the Tiverton maroon bags that you would have to pay that would go in towards uh, an increased revenue on that pay as you throw bags. And mo as I mentioned, most of the items, tires, we charge, but we have to pay somebody to get rid of them. Soiled mattresses, we have to pay somebody to get rid of them. The Freon. So there is some revenue, John, but it's, uh, again, I think that's uh, not a significant number to offset uh, any decrease in the overall operating costs. So follow-up question then for you, because, again, as somebody who frequents the landfill, that dump truck is 50-50 between some maroon bags and the, we'll call them the black bags. Um, is that number, when, when uh, Tim, when, when you did this, the estimates on what's going up, uh, what's going to be going up to the central, um, is that number 
include the waste that people are going to bring that are, people are currently bringing directly to the landfill, not in maroon bags that aren't getting picked up curbside, or the waste that is being brought to the landfill in maroon bags, because there's a significant amount of waste that people bring directly to our landfill that I don't. It doesn't seem to me is is figured into the estimate as to what we'd be sending to Johnston. So the way the way we the way we calculated the number going to Johnston, we looked at it two ways. We looked at the number of trucks that get delivered every day, no matter what they're carrying, whether it be red bags, black bags. We looked at the number of trucks being carried every day. We assumed that those trucks were full, and how much tonnage would each truck hold. That's one way we looked at it. The other way, what we do, we don't run these trucks over scales coming in and out of the, the landfill, so we don't know the exact weight. But what we do every year, actually what we do every six months, is we do a survey of the landfill. And we make an estimate of how much, based on that survey, how much um, waste was buried in the landfill every six months. And from that, we use some conversion factors to convert that volume into a tonnage. So we looked at it two ways, and we took a little bit more of the conservative estimate, which actually winds up being the adding up all the trucks that go there, it winds up being a little bit higher. And that's how we came up with an estimate. We estimated around 6,000 tons uh, per year. Great. So, but what I'm, what I'm saying is that if you're using the number of trucks that go up there, you're missing the number of times that the dump truck up at the landfill goes and dumps waste from the drop-off point down into where they're currently dra dra depositing waste in the valley. Because so we, did a, we did a balancing act between uh, the trucks that are going You're missing probably a truck a week. A, you, wouldn't that be so part a, of the measurement? Not necessarily. I mean, if you're saying you're looking at this over a six-month time period, you know, there's no measure by, I mean, again, I, I have never seen a PAR person up at right. our landfill, so, you know, there's no way to measure how much cover is being put in with the trash, you know, how much of that actually is trash. It just, it seems like this is a really rough estimate, and it, you know, as we get into the numbers here, it looks like a rather specific number that we're assuming we're going to be paying to Johnston to send trash up there. So we, I would agree, this is, it's a rough estimate. Um, we erred on the conservative side to make sure that it was, you know, that the number encompasses things like a truck a week maybe that doesn't get counted for. Um, so we put the estimate of landfilling rate at the landfill somewhere between, on an annual basis, it's somewhere between about 4,500 and 5,500 tons a year. For the purpose of this estimate, we use 6,000 tons per year. So like I said, we tried to err on the side of conservative so that we made sure we had enough money in the budget to cover that, that tonnage. And then the reason it's a very specific number is because it's 6,000 tons times a very specific tipping rate. The rate is it's $47, it's $47 per ton for the first, for Tiverton, it will be for the first 5,100 tons. And then after that, the next 900 tons um, get tipped at a higher rate. So Tiverton is, is capped at 5,100 tons um, next year, what they can take to Central. Got it. Um, okay, so thank you for that, yep. by the way. Um, I do have a couple more questions. I apologize. Um, so when we look at the closure plan, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, but the as you go up the landfill, up the old road, that's where we're filling trash today, right? Up the new road is up around the side to where that pad is. And on the right-hand side, that's the actual height of the original lease that we got from Rhode Island DEM, correct? The, the DEM says that uh, we can fill up to 160 feet mean sea level. That's the top. Um, that, the tallest part of the landfill is the southern half of the landfill, that peak at the southern half. That's the tallest piece of the landfill. That's closest to 160 right gotcha. now. Gotcha. Yep. So, so where the pad is now, right, obviously that's not near 160. But the closure plan, is that still to have that portion brought up to the same height as the southern portion of the landfill with the valley in the middle? Uh, it won't be brought up to the same height. It but will it will be, be brought up? It will be brought up uh, because we have to shape it to make sure that water sh uh, sheds off it properly. Um, so there's some shaping and grading that we'll, we'll have to do to that portion of it um, before we cap it. But so it won't be brought up to the same height. So is there, is there a, a, a significant amount of fill that's going to have to go in there? Uh, it's not significant. There's a little bit of fill. And that's included in the cost estimate for the landfill closure. Okay. Is to bring in the material that we'll need for shaping and grading. Gotcha. The, the only reason I ask, and for anybody at home, is because um, over the last few years, the assumption that I was under, having looked at a, a few of these, was that we were going to have to raise that northern part of the landfill up. And 
um, in my opinion, if that's what we're going to have to pay to truck fill in to increase the height of that in any significant way, we should be going back to Rhode Island DEM and asking them or telling them that we should be allowed to put trash in that as opposed to pay for fill. Just my thoughts. And that's it. And thank you, John. Anybody else in the council? Anything, Steve? Nancy, John, I just I just wanted to say one thing. I wanted to thank everybody for coming, but I also want to remind people that um, Pear, who was nice enough to come again tonight, gave a full presentation on July 29th. It was a, a town council public hearing and a workshop. Anyone was welcome, and they gave a very full presentation and were there for questions. And then the town council at their August 13 meeting took a vote. Um, so just be aware of what the town, what is on the town council agenda, and if it is of interest to you, especially before votes happen, um, to make an effort to get there and get the information when it's being given and questions can be asked. Thank you. In that case, if there's nothing else, thank you again for coming out. To those of you who are watching uh, on television or if you have comments or questions, please feel free to share them with us. You can uh, send an email to town clerk Nancy Mello and ask her to forward it to the rest of the council. Um, or you can uh, send a letter to the council, whatever. If you've got any other thoughts or questions on this, please, we're soliciting feedback. So thank you, and can I have a motion to adjourn? And a second? second? All in favor? And we're adjourned. Thank you, everybody.